This will be the most dramatic podcast ever. When you're not filming, what does that look like? Honestly, like Bachelor, it's a lonely existence. I do think in this business, you have to be okay with big ups and downs. Something controversial happens. Send out Chris Harrison, send out Chris Harrison. You're being used for your face and your voice and your likeness. Your name is on the line here. You look behind you and you're like, oh crap, nobody's standing behind me. Was he flirting with me? Were you? You heard it here first. This is going to be the most unforgettable, amazing, captivating podcast yet. I have Chris Harrison here and his lovely wife, Lauren Zima. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You left out dramatic. Oh, dramatic. Yeah. Can you do it? Actually, can you enter the podcast? Go. This will be the most dramatic <laughs> podcast ever. Which is also the name of our podcast. So it's a really helpful plug. That was a nice, easy plug. Four Thank you, guys. Will, are here. One <laughs> will be leaving brokenhearted. Oh God. In the back of a limo crying. Let's make that come true. Let's deliver on one of your lines yes. for once and someone be in tears by the end of this. Let me tell you something about my wife. She firmly believes without a doubt that she could go on the bachelorette and win the entire thing. She, it's a game. She literally, what are you winning? Yeah. Um, it's not, it wouldn't be about for me, like winning the guy. I just, I think that there's a complete, I mean, you, I mean, you could, we'll ask you, there's a full strategy. So like at the end, you would just, you'd get that proposal and you would just drop the ring and just walk off like in your face. <laughs> I won this thing. No, I would have, I would have a Bethany Frankel situation. Like I would have like my water that we're going to launch. <laughs> like no, they got the Bethany claws now, right? Or like, you know, remember Shane Lamas had like the huge sunglasses. Yeah. Remember she used to wear those yeah, yeah. huge sunglasses. And when she was wearing them when I was little, I'd be, I'd be like, she's got to launch a sunglass line. Like I'd be content marketing for yeah. the bigger picture. You were doing this as a child? Oh, that's... I loved branding. Wow. wow. No, but, but she's being, uh, being fully... She actually believes that she can edge out all the other women. So and, what's and the win. strategy? The strategy is you can't pop your puss the first night. Okay. But you can't pop but your puss. I guess it could me in real life too. Can they I, get can too I get excited. A, can I uh, ask the judges, can I get a definition of what that... <laughs> Is that just putting it all out there? <laughs> Honey, that's the name puss. of your new reality show that you're coming back with. Pop it's the called puss. Pop the Puss. <laughs> Popping the Puss is getting too excited too quick. Yeah. It's, you got well, to. You want to fly under the radar, yeah. but here is the caveat to your dreams. <laughs> Producers, we're going to get to the bottom of Lauren. We're going to push you. And if you're not, if you are playing the game and you're not playing it the way we want, we're going to make life very difficult on you. And they've okay. been doing this for a long time. <laughs> we're going, we're undefeated. I'm game. I'm game. I still yeah, no, think. Well, that's thing is if, if you will lean in. I'll lean into, no, I would definitely yeah. lean into using the producers to the advantage and doing what they needed. Right. But. You would be good. I think you're savvy enough. I, I think that people get too stuck in the mud and the drama and the minutia. You got to be, you got to have big vision. I think what you just said is smart that you would align with the producers. 100%. I think when people try the to smart break ones, apart, the smart ones do. it doesn't work out well. But yeah. wait, Michael, you just said, did you just ask how many women think they could? And I want to know that too. Like how well, many people I, went on the show? How many everybody <laughs> who's ever been on a reality show ever <laughs> thinks they're going to come off like the hero, like, oh, I'll never be that person. I'll never do this. I'll never do this. I'll never be seen as this type of person. And you will. Because- I don't need to be the hero. That's I'll be good. the villain. You'll be the villain. Okay. I'll be what it takes. The villain's not going to win though, probably. Okay. But then maybe that I'll be like, I won't be, I don't need to be the hero. That's like the sweet yeah. girl. You, the thing is you want to be good enough TV. Okay. You're right. Fly under the radar. Don't pop the puss night one. <laughs> but at some point you got to pop a little. Yeah. And, Pull uh, that clip, Carson. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, you work with the producers. Don't try and be an enemy of the state and try and fight the system because the system will always win because it's their show. Yeah. The editors, the producers are always going to have final say. Who's someone who fought against the producers? Um, wow. Good question. I don't know. Let's see. I'm trying to think of a, of a Kelly bachelor. Kelly Flanagan from Peter Weber's season comes yeah. to mind for me. She was always, remember how she just laid down? Like she just took naps. She just was not, I don't think she, I, I, I can't remember what Kelly's story of coming onto the show was, but I remember thinking, I don't know why she's here, you know? Yeah. But Juan our, Pablo. Oh. Okay. Uh, kind of 
bucked the, the system and the system turned against them. Oh, so what happened there? How did that go? They, it was the first time that they turned against a lead and, and they decided we're just going to not make him the golden boy. We're going to just show him as he is. And it didn't come off well. And because usually our leads are protected. Bachelor. You want the bachelor bachelorette to be seen as perfect. You know, this person that everyone in the Americas will be willing to leave everything to fall in love with. As the show evolved, did you guys need to, or did they need to start kind of moving away from that picture perfect vision to keep it interesting or was it? Well, they had to because you, we stopped being able to cast those people, right? The, the idea of the show was Andrew Firestone. You know, where in the world will you have the Heir opportunity? Heir to an American fortune. Right. Uh, Aaron Berge, even, who, you know, was one of our earlier, who owned a bank, even to the point of Chris Soules, farmer, you know, he's this very successful farmer in Iowa. And if it weren't for the show, you would not, you know, this guy wouldn't find love. He's a, it was the diamond in the rough. That was the idea of this fairy tale. At some point, I don't know, just casting wise, we stopped casting quality people of that ilk where it was no longer the diamond in the rough. And it was like, eh, he's an influencer who hasn't really worked in six years. He's in tech. And uh, his name is Michael Boston. lives with his parents. And he does a podcast. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, so, you know, the, the fairy tale. He's in sales. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was harder and harder to sell this fairy tale. And I've talked to people that have been on the show since I have left. And they're like, yeah, you know, he doesn't have a job and there's not much to offer. And why am I putting myself out there for this? And so now you just have these influencers that are on for someone who's unemployed and it's not that attractive. And they just want followers. Right. Can you educate me? Cause I am maybe not as well-versed as all of you on this. The early shows, the early mm. days, how many of those relationships actually like stayed and stable and made Not it? many. Not many. Yeah, Trista. No. Trista. Yeah, Trista and Ryan. We, oh boy, we hung our hat on Trista and Ryan. Sean and, and Catherine. And then we got to Sean Lowe and we're like, finally, we have someone to hang our hat on with Sean Lowe. Um, and he was another good one where he was still in that golden age of just had a great guy really true conservative faith based dude that football player. Yeah, football player from Kansas State. And, um, and so that those, those relationships, we weren't great at fostering, you know, we had a great show idea. The producers like, okay, we got this great show and they did. It was a phenomenal groundbreaking concept for television and it changed the genre. But what we weren't great at is being therapists. We weren't, we weren't creating a great environment for people to stay in love. The idea of the show was fall in love. And then the show ended and we're like, well, we need to facilitate these relationships and help them stay together. And we weren't great at that in the beginning. We got better over time. I want to go back before all of this. Mm -hmm. We just were on you guys' podcast and you talked about how when you were a little boy, you were narrating your brothers playing sports. Annoying as shit. You yeah. wanted to be the host at the talent show. I would love for you each to tell your stories of how you guys got interested in hosting separately and doing what you're doing before all of the, the glamour. We came about it in very different ways, which we talked, we just had this conversation the other day. Cause I don't know if my path makes sense anymore. Um, the way I used to tell people to get in this business is I, I went through the local news world. I went to college, played soccer. I was a good soccer player. Not great. I was good. Got a scholarship. And I, when I was in school, I found mass comm and, and media and TV. And I had a guy there reach out to me and say, Hey, I'm looking for someone to do play by play for the basketball team. I went to Oklahoma city university, really small NAI school in Oklahoma city. And I started doing play by play for my basketball team. And just, it, I, I don't do drugs, but it was like drugs. As soon as that hit my veins, I'm like, this is what I'm meant to do. I no longer cared about soccer. I no longer cared about that path. And this is all I really wanted to do. And I became a sportscaster for KWTV in Oklahoma city, the local CBS affiliate. I was a, uh, weekend morning guy. Then I became the third guy on the team, the reporter. Then I took over the weekend, the number two spot. And I was working my way up and just wanted to move back home to Dallas, which is where I'm from and be a sportscaster. And I was on the road to doing that when I got a call to move out to LA and start up a horse racing network for all things. And when I got to LA, this whole world opened up and I was so green and so naive. And I think I always say, you know, desperation is the world's worst cologne when you're desperate and you're in Hollywood, 
write that you, down. You reek of it, right? You, you have this desperate, like, I want to be an actor. And I, I had a good gig. I was making what I thought was a crap ton of money doing this horse racing thing. So I just started auditioning for stuff. I was doing TV shows. I did movies. I was having so much fun. And I think because A, I wasn't desperate and I was a fresh face, I started getting hired for all kinds of stuff. And I did a game show, did a home and garden show called Designers Challenge that did really well. Did a, you know, mall, mall of, was it Mall Masters at Mall of America in Minneapolis? Did that. So did a bunch of stuff. And then The Bachelor came around and I got that gig. And I was like, but it was, it wasn't The Bachelor. It was just a reality show. No one had heard of reality TV. Survivor had just started when I got the gig. And, you know, you look back on it and you think, oh my God, that was groundbreaking. It was not at the time. But I will tell you as a little girl, I remember tuning into the first season of The Bachelor. Remind me who the first Alex one. Michelle. Alex Michelle. Yes, yes, they, yes, you yes, may yes. have not even tuned into the first one. No, a lot I did. of people think I did. I did. Yeah. I did. I, I can picture it. And I, I remember that the show was really avant garde. There's I and I don't Very. know how I knew that as a little girl, but there was a Well, because what else besides Survivor was similar to that? Yeah, Nothing. That we had Survivor was, was a game show. Survivor was groundbreaking, but it came out of Eco Challenge, which was a brilliant show that was on uh Discovery or something like that, that um Burnett had done. And then he got Survivor on the air. He shopped it around town. Of course, the famous story is no one wanted it. And he paid for it himself, which is why he made a buttload of money because he owned, it was a timeshare, right? And so he owned the advertising. And so Survivor was on, but it was a game show that we could all understand, right? It was groundbreaking, but understandable because it was a game. It was a competition. The Bachelor was no, no longer a game. There was nothing on the line. We weren't offering you a million dollars. We offered you nothing, in fact. The whole catch was, it's like Seinfeld. The show's about nothing. You were at the end left with, are you going to choose love? And that's it. Camera stop, game over. There was you no got house. A ring. Yeah, but there's no house. There's no million dollars. There's no, it no was I guess just, you're right. There's love. Yeah, that's but it. People love love. Is that important yes. enough? And the answer was yes. We all have an insatiable appetite for love. You're right. You were asking that question and the answer was yes. Everybody, like that's everybody's ultimate goal, right? Is true love. I want to get back to, to that chapter, but I want to hear Lauren about how you got into what you were doing. Yeah, I, I think I was the kind of the turning point of what he's talking about, like this local news thing not being a path anymore. Like I studied journalism in school. He and I both did. Um, I went to Mizzou, great journalism school, at University of Missouri. And we I was in school being brought up to learn like you're going to start in a really small market and local news and then you might get to like a Dallas or Chicago or then LA and New York. And it's this path. But then kind of by the time I graduated, that was when the recession hit. And that was when like online video was starting like 2009 and everything was changing. And when I graduated, I got offered a weekend anchor gig um, and I turned it down, which felt kind of crazy. But I was like, I don't want to, I was young. I didn't have responsibilities to anyone. And I thought, I don't want to make this local news choice. And luckily at that time, like I, I could do it and it was fine. So instead I um, took a, an internship at Variety in LA. And then from there, I actually realized I didn't really love LA as much as I thought I would. So I took this startup job back in the Midwest at a company called Newsy, which was being very avant-garde and doing only online news video. And then long story short, Entertainment Tonight, which was an older school brand, came to Newsy trying to figure out how we were making all this online news video um, and offered me a job on the spot. And then I moved back to LA and started working at Entertainment I was, Tonight. <laughs> I was looking at the date. You asked me like the listener and a lot of our listeners are under the age of 25. And mm -hmm. I say that because, and I'm going to tell the story about Lauren and correct me if I'm wrong. She studied television broadcasting. And I remember when we first started dating, 2008, 2009, 10, around that area, I remember her getting up early and going to news stations because you had to like go and guest and do things for it's those lot, stations. It's a lot of work. Anyways, yeah, you guys to, be have done put, a lot to get of work. a chance to be able to be put on a show or television. And I, I reason I bring this up is I don't think so many, I don't think people realize how fortunate we are now to live in a time where you can get on this and potentially get the same amount of eyeballs, if not way, way more without having the gatekeepers right. of a news station to get you out there. The right. only thing is uh, one thing I really admire about Lauren and I went through the same path and I think it's lost today. It's a lost art is how to be a host, how to be an anchor, how to be a journalist. Um, you know, we approach things very differently than I know a lot of people do. And, and look, one of the jokes on my show 
every year, all I created was 25 to 30 people who wanted my job and thought they could do my job as well, if not better. And I think time has now proven that's not the case. And so, people, well, no, but it's, you know, people didn't work at it. No. They had no, they didn't have the talent and the skill set. They just saw what we were doing. They see what you guys are doing. Like, oh, that sounds fun. I want to do that. I think it's a job that can look really easy. Like nobody looks at a neurosurgeon and thinks, oh, I could do that. But this is a job where you can make it look really easy if you're good at it. And he made it look really easy. The so, most powerful people, though, do make things look effortless. Yeah. There's yeah. an art to making I, things I, look effortless. Yeah, I think it's worth remembering anytime you see, I, I think I believe this about everything, any successful field, when you look at the people on the top of their game, there are probably some areas where like it is an quote unquote, e like it is easy to mm -hmm. talk on a podcast. It is not easy to, to get to the top of the podcast. Right. Heap. It's a different thing. And whenever I see that, I'm like, there is some skill here that people are being naive about. Mm. Right. I think one thing that connected us right from the beginning, like our first date and probably even before we were dating, when I was just interviewing him, we had a mutual respect for each other. Like we didn't know it at the time, but Neither of us got into this business wanting to be famous. We both studied and we both wanted to be successful. And I think we both wanted to be good storytellers. Um, I think it's, if you're just searching for that fame thing, whether you're an influencer or whatever, if you're not like creating something you're trying to share or create a business as you guys have both done so well, it doesn't work or it feels really empty really fast and it it, it can't sustain itself. But that was, you know, yeah, the... The working towards not fame, but success, I think connected us really early on. I have an upcoming trip that I'm packing for and I scoured the internet for packing cubes. And finally, I came across base. I mean, I've used base many times. I actually have their cosmetic bag that I use for all my skincare when I travel. And then I have one of their luggage pieces too. But I had forgotten that they have packing cubes and they have the best ones. First of all, they're absolutely beautiful. The ones that I like are in olive and beige. I went with the beige initially and then I went back and got the olive, but it comes in a set of six and they really have packing down to a science. You only need a few packing cubes that compress and the ones that they've designed absolutely fit perfect into your bag so you can maximize space while minimizing time. I really think you guys should go with the beige if you're going to get one, but the olive don't sleep on it. They also have luggage on their site. I have some of their luggage pieces and then you have to check out their cosmetic case. I have that in beige too. And I so good that I got it in black. This literally fits everything. So everything you could ever imagine in one spot ready to go. You have your packing cubes. You have your cosmetic case that even have a hanging cosmetic case. They've truly thought of everything. There's a reason why people are so obsessed. It has over 30,000 five-star reviews. We actually used our own code right now. Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash skinny. Go to basetravel.com slash skinny for 15% off your purchase. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash skinny. One thing that I do not mess around with when it comes to my kids is sun protection. And I was recommended actually by my facialist to use sun bum. The one that I like for them is the baby bum, but the specific one I like is the mineral sunscreen spray. This is SPF 50. It's a spray. So you don't have to deal with all this like white goop all over them. It's the mineral sunscreen, which I personally think is the best sunscreen for kids. My facialist Stacy Christie agrees. It's the baby bum mineral sunscreen 50. That is the one that I recommend to all my friends. If you're on their site, they have all the things. So Sunbum recently launched a new sunscreen and Sunbum's new sunscreen thinks it's a moisturizer, which is an amazing thing. It's called Daily Gel. It's truly invisible and we love it as a makeup primer. Daily Face is your one and done moisturizer. Daily Body feels like your favorite body lotion, but with SPF. So put it on in the morning and forget about it. So it's Daily Gel, Daily Face, and Daily Body. It's 24-hour hydration, SPF 50, and sheer and invisible. They really know how to do it when it comes to sunscreen. Visit sunbum.com and use code SKINNY15 at checkout. You get 15% off your purchase. That's S-U-N-B-U-M dot com, code SKINNY15. You get 15% off your first order. And I will tell you, get the Baby Bum Mineral Sunscreen. And if you're going to pick another one, definitely check out the Daily Gel because it is truly invisible. 
Let's kick your health into overdrive talking about Symbiotica, one of our favorite partners of this show. We have been talking about Symbiotica on this platform for years now. We've actually had the founders of Symbiotica on this show, I think five or six times in total. That's because there is so much to talk about with the team over there. They are doing so many incredible things. They're all such wealths of knowledge and health. I want to highlight today some of our favorites. I think Symbiotica makes one of the best glutathions on the entire market. It's all in liposomal delivery. So you're eating the supplement actually like food. And that's going to be an incredible antioxidant to help your body just completely perform better. They also have an incredible magnesium L3 night, one of the only magnesiums that crosses the blood brain barrier. It is an incredible product because again, it is liposomal. The way that I take it every single day is I put it in my coffee. I have gotten rid of all sweeteners. You can also put it in matcha as well or tea just stir it in the morning. And instead of having sugar or some artificial sweetener, you're getting this magnesium that's going to be great for your brain. It's going to sweeten your drink a little bit. And it just overall tastes incredible. It's going to help you with cognition, with sleep, all sorts of different things. So many of us lack magnesium, which we've talked about on this show. So be sure to check them out. Symbiotica, like I said, they have such a wide range of incredible products. It's honestly hard to pick a favorite. If I was going to highlight a couple others, their vitamin D3 and K2 is incredible. Their vitamin B12, all again in liposomal delivery. So check it out. Start your subscription today. You can save up to 15% off your subscription with our code SKINNY. Just go to symbiotica.com and use code SKINNY on your subscription order. Again, that's symbiotica.com, code SKINNY. Can you guys talk to me about the minutia of 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 what you've built? Meaning like talk to me about like having to do your own makeup or waking up at 3 a.m. because you have to host something like people. I want to hear like the nitty gritty of what it's taken to get to the levels that you're at. Yeah, I did my own makeup on Entertainment Tonight for several years and people couldn't believe that. But I did my own makeup for a while because I was technically a digital correspondent. And then I moved up to a union job and then I had to like union rules. I had to get makeup. So that was like a big deal for me. And I yeah, I mean, but yeah, crazy hours like your life's not your own. And there's a million harder jobs out there. I'm not curing cancer. But like one thing that we almost I mean, we talk a lot about how the pandemic really like helped us have a relationship because before that, I think our hours were so crazy. I don't think we would have had time to like actually date each other. Yeah. I mean, it's I love what I do. I've always loved what I've done. But yeah, I mean, starting out, I slept on the floor of the sports office because I would work the Friday night high school football show. And then I would spend the night and I had four sports casts starting at 6 a.m. And you would spend the night and get up and you, I, I would edit, produce, write my own shows, do the shows, do your own makeup. You know, as soon as weather came on, you knew you had five minutes before you were on and that was life and it was awesome. But flash forward 30 years and I'm doing The Bachelor, the biggest, you know, network show. It's as high as you can possibly get. I'm sleeping in a closet. <laughs> I would get dressed in a van in Thailand. You know, it, it's not like, oh my God, you now fly around on a private jet and you have the best. It's, trust me, if they can save $4, they're going to save $4 and you're going to get dressed in a van. <laughs> so, you know, it's like people always laugh at the bachelor mansion. They ask me, it's like, was this really the clo- the master closet upstairs where you would sleep and get just like, yeah, I would just grab a pillow and go crawl in the corner. The mansion is so much smaller than you think it's it like, is. that's it's the glamorous so life. And it was funny. I think, uh, Spade or somebody took over, uh, you know, when the first year I was, I didn't do paradise and they thought they were going to get a big celebrity to do the show. And, uh, Spade went down there and I had some people talk to him and he was like, F this man. He's like, who works like this? I'm like, yeah, the conditions suck. We're up all night. And, you know, all night until eight or nine in the morning. And then you're two hours later, you got to be back. And so you're not sleeping, you're not eating right. You're away from your family. And again, like Lauren said, we're not digging ditches. I've done that before and that sucks. But at the same time, it's never as, the real work is never as glamorous, but the people on our show and the people probably you guys talk to sometimes, they think it'll just be fun. I just want to do the fun stuff. And it's like, okay, and look, there's some rewarding stuff and I love what we do, but it's hard work and it's hard to make it look good. You have to work at it. It What is the off camera process? What does that look like when you're not filming? And I guess maybe not doing the quote unquote fun stuff. It's, it can, I mean, honestly, like bachelor, it's a lonely existence. It was really lonely. Um, what I get, what are you doing when you're not filming? Nothing. You're on the road alone, you know? So we, I would, I would try to entertain myself. Like I would go to soccer. I'm a big soccer fan. I'd go to soccer games around the world, or I'd go to like, uh, you know, play golf or do something. I'm in Africa, you know, during Brad Womack season. So I'm going to go on a safari, but you know, the you first went on a safari alone, it was like two of us, you know, or I'd go with my hair and makeup team, you know, it's like, or wardrobe, Carrie and Gina, and you know, you're like, 
you see an elephant knock a tree over to get the worms underneath. And your first thing is, oh, and you're reaching for your kids because you want your kid, you know, and, you know, you're FaceTiming your kids back home at weird hours because they're up eating breakfast and you're just a little picture on the table. And so there's some weird, lonely times. I spent a lot of years alone traveling around the world. And again, I'm not saying what was me. I had a great life and it gave me a wonderful life and it changed my kids' lives. Um, but at the same time, that stuff's hard. Uh, I would go days without speaking English to anybody because you're just traveling because the crew would go alone and I would try and stay to see like my kids play soccer or lacrosse or a play or something. And I would travel alone and you just get dropped off in the wilderness somewhere and you're just waiting to be picked up to shoot. And it's really weird. It's a weird life. Do you spend any time with the contestants when you're not filming or is it isolated where you're not really interacting with them? Not really hanging out with them. No, I mean, because they're in the bubble and you want them to stay in the bubble. And that was our job is to create that environment and keep them in that mindset. And I could, they really hated me being around because I would break that bubble and give them kind of sign of life and hope and give them, you know, we, we, (laughs) Ben Higgins talks, I, there's, I could list like Ben Higgins, Bob Guinea, Andrew Firestone, (laughs) all these bachelors have said to me since we've all become friends, They've said the only reason I made it through the show was because of Chris. Aww. They're like, he was like the friend I needed. Like Ben Higgins always tells the story of when Chris came to visit him in his hotel room. And I think Ben was like ready to quit the show. We were in the and, Bahamas at a house. And yeah. you like watched a game with him or something. And he said it mentally <laughs> brought him back. I mean, I'm telling his story here, but yeah, yeah, we just sat down to watch a football game. Like we just hang out. He's like, oh, thank God. But you hung out with the leads a little I bit. I did. Well, I would hang out with the leads, the bachelor, the bachelorette. I would see a lot more. The, the say contestants, the 25 or 30, I would not see them because they would use me as a trigger. Uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes emotional. So they wanted to like, when you saw me, you're like, oh shit, something's about to happen. Um, you know, I would sometimes roll the proverbial grenade in the room of like blowing things up. So they were very careful about, they didn't want to normalize me. Um, so it was really funny. A lot of times the bachelor, the bachelorette or the contestants would fly separately. So I would be on one of those flights. Sometimes I flew with the lead. Sometimes I would fly with the contestants, depending on our schedule. And oftentimes when I was with the contestants, they would, you know, all of a sudden just see me in a hat in the airport and they're like, shit, you're just normal. You're just real. (laughs) And they, you know, we'd have these conversations and I'd get to know them. Um, and I, I enjoyed getting to know them. I often said it wasn't until later after the show, when I would see them at charity events or whatever, where we would become good friends. Um, because I was used as a host and as a mechanism when I was taping the show. So it was really interesting. If you both could go back uh, with all of this stuff that you've seen, what would you tell yourself? What do you wish you did differently? Or are you just, Mm. are you happy with everything? Good question. Career wise or bachelor wise? (laughs) For both of you with your, both of your careers. Um, I think that I, you know, really like sitting here talking to you guys has made me realize like I need to go kind of back to that decision I made when I decided to not do the weekend anchor thing and to do the online thing again, like to keep embracing the change, you know, and sometimes it's a little hard because you feel like the change is happening so fast around you. Um, But yeah, there were like, like I kind of wish I'd really leaned into like YouTube earlier, done some of these things earlier. And um, I think it's really important. Like I always give this advice to say yes, like say yes to everything, especially when you're you're in your 20s and still figuring out who you are. And I think I did that. But like I'm kind of wanting to remind myself about it now. Like keep going, keep like leaning into all the new things are happening because sometimes the new things scare me. Yeah, like, you gotta, AI like you, you're saying me. like you want to be able to adapt. <laughs> yes. Just adapt yeah. quick. And uh, like Gary yes. Vee, I think is like such a good person to look to because he's always like yelling at you and being like, like he told everyone to get on TikTok like seven years ago. And mm-hmm. he's like, I-, I fucking told you to get on fucking TikTok. <laughs> and I'm like, he's right. Like if we had all gotten on TikTok seven years ago, that would it would look different. He's like so like good at adapting. So yes. that is really good advice. Yes. I-, I don't think I would change anything. I think I would tell myself, I-, I would love to have the hindsight to know your show will have the longevity it's it's had you're going to be on air for 18 19 years that's crazy because it doesn't happen that's a long time it doesn't happen in our business and so i played scared and it's it was probably a good thing the people i've met that i really admire in this business the joan rivers of the world the people that had that longevity they also played scared 
When you say play scared, what do you mean by that? They always assumed everything was going away. They played to the man. Yeah. You just, well, you just, you, you had this fear that tomorrow it could all be taken away. Um, you wake up and you're just like, you know, the ratings are gone. Like, you know, that I just always had the belief it was never promised to you. Next week was never promised to you. I would wake up and I would get the ratings on Thursday morning or Tuesday mornings when we moved to Mondays. And I just remember being, you know, used to, used to call a line. They would have every network had a number. I would get up in the morning at six 30 in the morning. I would get the fast nationals and I'm writing them all down. I mean, every week I had, I kept the papers for forever. (laughs) I know the ratings forever. I still do this because now it's online. I get the ratings every day. I watch the best season that's ever done. The best show, the single show was the end of Aaron Berge season. The finale did 33 million viewers. And he married what, uh, what is the girl? I forget the girl. They didn't get married. They got engaged. engaged. And then, but the biggest overall season was that we went from Aaron Berge to Trista season. Yeah. And that was from start to finish the highest ratings. You know why? I think it's because we got, didn't we get to know Trista on another season before yeah, she, she came out of Alex Michelle season yeah. one? That's, that's, that's the season. That's what yeah. I knew. I was like, how am I not remembering Trista? And that came was out really rare Michelle. because we never, you know, we weren't doing that back then. Alex Michelle, Aaron Berge, uh, Bob Guinea was kind of our first repeat because he came off the bachelorette with Trista Wren. Right. And he, you know, he was kind of that lovable, you know, and Bob will kill me, but he was this kind of heavy, overweight guy. And he was, mad because he's like, well, my foot was in a boot. I played football at Michigan state and I was heavy because I was in a boot. And then oh, he, he was came like back. lovable dad. Bod. Yeah. But he was had dad bod. He's like, mm-hmm. I don't have a dad bod. F you guys, I'm all fit. <laughs> um, but so Bob was the first repeat guy, but Trista was from that first season. Um, but yeah, if I could tell myself, Hey dude, relax, you're going to have longevity. You can have this show. You're going to go for 18, 19 years. But th- I, I probably would have said no to stuff that I, that I really jumped on. Like I probably wouldn't have done. And I know you guys won't even remember this TV guide. I did a daily show for them. I executive produced and hosted the red carpet shows Damn. for the Grammys, Oscars and all that stuff. And I did that because I always assumed the bachelor was waning and it would go away. And at one point we kind of were canceled. Uh, Lloyd Braun, who was president of ABC, this was around Trav, Dr. Travis Stork. When we went to Paris, the reason we went to Paris that season was we said, F it. The show's canceled. We're off the air. Let's go spend every dime we have and let's go live in Paris. And we did. And we thought the show was going to be dead. Travis Stork's season did good. Then we came back with uh, Dr. Uh, Naval uh, Doctor. Um, crap. Why am I blanking on him? Anyway, so we did this officer and a gentleman season with this uh, Naval Doctor and it did very well. And all of a sudden we were back and we're like, crap. Here we go again. Wait, what's the what's the guy that's on the doctors? Travis? Travis. Stork. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it was after that. It was a naval guy. Yeah, the season after. Will you tell us who it was, Carson? That's gonna kill me. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Baldwin. Andrew Andy Baldwin. Dr. Andy Baldwin. Yeah. Right. Is he, he was on the doctors too? He was a swimmer at Duke. No. And uh he was a naval doctor. Okay. And uh it was great. It was a phenomenal season. So we did that. And uh the best thing I remember about that season, I don't know why this sticks out. We had this, we had him drive up in this amazing sports car. It's like a silver Lamborghini or something. And we shot it in, uh, just above, um, Hollywood and we we're on this hill and he got out of the car looking all studly and he got out and I guess he forgot to set the brake. And so he got out in the car, <laughs> just started rolling backwards and big Polly, if anyone remembers big Polly, he was the guy, um, who was, he would come get the suitcases from time to time. He was the grim reaper and he would like, literally was holding the car from like sliding down the driveway. Um, but Andy Baldwin did well and that resurrected the show. I do think in this business, you have to be okay with big ups and downs and no, it doesn't mean it's over. Like, you know, we live in this, everything's really fast now, but like, I think about Robert Downey Jr., that man's career was like, no one would hire him in the nineties because he'd had all these addiction issues and been in and out of jail and no one would hire him. No one would insure him. And then he became Iron Man. And it's like, now we all love him. And just, we get a two minute award show speech from him and we're all- Look at Rob Lowe. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know if you guys are old enough to know the scandal. Go Google Rob Lowe and his scandals. And now he's one of the most beloved kind of middle-aged figures and and you guys think John Stamos is handsome? Look, I, I look read into Rob, Rob Lowe's, Lowe's book eyes. too. Rob, Rob, you can come on the podcast if you want. Look into his eyes. <laughs> Rob, I Rob, dare you. Rob, Rob Lowe can come on the podcast. It's an open invite. I told, I told this story. I was this back when I was single and I went on a date and I would escape LA. With and, Rob Lowe. And I went up, I wish, I would date <laughs> Rob Lowe in a heartbeat. No, I was in Montecito because uh, I would get out of LA because I didn't want to be seen. And this, I had a blind date with this woman who lived in Montecito and 
I met Rob Bowe because he had an ABC show at the time. Because he lives up there, yeah? yeah. Yeah, and we were friendly. And enough, like, if we saw each other, you'd give each other the, the bro hug. And so he sees me from across the room, and we kind of do the, the, the bro nod, you know? And mm-hmm. he gets up, and I was like, oh, fuck. Like, don't walk over here. Like, the last thing a dude wants next to me is Rob Lowe. On it's a like, date. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, I don't want, like, I don't want my date to see Rob Lowe. Yeah. You're like Patrick Dempsey walking over. Yeah. I'm like, dude, stay away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't blame How do you. Think you think I no, look but now? You, you're looking great, but yeah. like Rob Lowe is like, Rob Lowe is Rob Lowe. Yeah, Rob Lowe I just, just felt like the Rob rest Lowe. of the dinner, she's like, oh. Oh, but you're not Rob Lowe. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and he's right there. Yeah, he's right yeah. there. How did you guys meet amongst all of this? You said you met five years ago or you started dating five years we ago? We started dating a little over five years ago. But had known each other professionally for a couple of years, like a couple then. years. I, I was on entertainment tonight and I covered the bachelor. And by the way, here's the thing. I, I, I think I actually had some, Becca Tilly, God lover said to me at our wedding, Oh my God, Lauren, you like made every girl's dream come true. Like you grew up watching the bachelor and then you married the host. And I was like, I did not grow up watching the bachelor. I was a housewives girly still am. And the only reason I started covering the bachelor was because when I got to entertainment tonight, and this is a say yes thing. No one was covering it. And I said, well, I, I can cover it. Like I can watch the show and figure it out and cover it. So I knew nothing about the show. And there is, as he's sitting here talking, there's all this bachelor history. Like you grew up, what I don't know any of these people. I started watching it, I think with Chris Souls a season, maybe, yeah. or maybe Caitlin Bristow's, I don't know. But so I interviewed him. So I interviewed him for three years or so. And I was married. He was dating someone else like, and we only ever saw each other on red carpets. And that's the only conversation we'd ever had. And then we both became single. And I then I did an, an interview with him and I was like, was he flirting with me? Were you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, but did, uh, be honest. When I You heard it here first. When did Was there a spark the first time you guys met? No. no. Nothing. No, she, you know, and not to be a dick. But, <laughs> we were both so quickly like, no, no, but no, I mean, absolutely I, not. Fully and, and I don't mean to treat people like this, but like you, when you're doing the show, thousands of interviews, I've done thousands and thousands of interviews just, about, about like, the show. Like yeah, rinse it's, and repeat. Yeah. It's, and you would just, but I will say, I knew she was different only as a journalist and I really respected her. And I looked, I remember looking forward to her interviews because when you do thousands of interviews, 99% of them are just so, like you said, rinse and repeat. <laughs> they don't challenge you. They don't listen. They're just asking these questions on the paper and they're moving on. And you're just saying, regardless of what they ask, you're giving the answer that you want to give and you're moving on. Lauren would listen and push you and and ca- do call, really call back the really stuff you said. I'm like, so I knew I had to be on my game when Lauren Zima came from Entertainment Tonight. And I really enjoyed those interviews from journalist to journalist because that was my background too. And I'm like, oh, this girl's good. And, but I knew nothing of her and I never, you know, as soon as we were done, you have a handler who's next, 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 and you're just kind of moving on. And so I never saw her for who she is until there was one day and we were at the studio. I took a break and she came out of the green room where we kept all the animals. Uh, no, all the, all the journalists would watch the show and I was on stage. So I came out and I was getting a tea and she was coming out and I didn't know why, but I found out later it was so hopefully we might run into each other because we'd had a couple flirty moments before that. But it was really the first time I looked at her, looked at her. And I was like, oh, damn, like, <laughs> shit, like, Thanks, why, how have I not seen this before? Why, you know, but I didn't have those eyes on because I, I was either married or dating somebody and I just wasn't paying attention in that way, just being professional. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, she's hot. And then, yeah, okay. And we started talking. It was, I interviewed him. I thought he was a little flirty. And then truly I was at this next taping and I, I said to myself, okay, God, (laughs) if he was flirting with me, I I said, I'm going to go, this is a nine hour taping. I'm going to go get a coffee at craft services right now. And if he happens to be there at this exact moment, then we're supposed to talk like something's Smart. supposed to happen here. Give and, him a little test. <laughs> yeah. and he just happened to be there. And so then we had our first real conversation off of a red carpet. And then I'll be honest, I slid into his DMs. I was like, hey, so good to see you nice. the other day. Yeah. I'm a big believer in open the door. And if they walk through, keep going. 
I don't like, I think it's unfair when people put the onus on other people to make the first move all the time. I think women do it with men. Like, I'm not saying chase them, but I think open let the door. Let them know that you're, yeah, that there's a, let show them know interest. that there is an opening. Yes. Yeah. And if, and then if he doesn't walk through, like, don't go yeah. through the door yourself. And I thought Keep it was going cute. down the hallway. But if he walks through, okay. She said, hashtag send nudes. And I no. said, that's so adorable. <laughs> um, no, and, and you know what? I, timing, Lauren and I talk about this all the time. Timing is everything. I was at a place in my life, so was she, but I was at a place in my life, my kids were old enough because when I got divorced, I really dove into my kids and being a dad and making sure they were taken care of. And then my profession was such a huge part of my life. I had these two boxes and that was it. I really wanted to be a good dad and I wanted to be really good at hosting and, and I wanted to crush it professionally. And I was doing both very well. I didn't have time for that third box of myself. I knew I would. I think I, I knew I would get there. And so I, I dated and, but I didn't really commit and she, f we ran into each other just kind of that perfect time of the bachelor was kind of on cruise control. I knew I, you know, killing it there. That's fine. The kids were old. They were really good people. They're both driving. They're in high school, pretty self-sufficient, doing good there. I have time for myself now and I'm kind of lonely. I'm like, I'm ready to like, I'm ready to put myself out there because you do, if you are single, you have to be willing to put yourself out there and truly be vulnerable and date. And so when she reached out, I was eager and it was, the, it was great timing because I was open to that. He was so deeply lonely. That he, no, I'm just yeah. I mean, well, and I always respected I looked forward to our interviews too, because he was so good at doing an interview. Like I knew I would get my headlines from him and my great sound bites from him. Um, but I, I think our love story is like, I, I give the advice a lot that be open. Like you don't know where this person's going to come from. Like I, I have a friend who's single and I think she writes people off on that first look a lot, you know, or it's oh, like, we she's, have one of those friends. Right? Yeah. She's really big on first impressions or like, if there isn't the chemistry right away. He's and, not six, three. Uh, yeah. He's I'm like, like, uh, we knew each other for like four years. I mean, you guys have the, a similar story of you were to, you know, knew each other and then went apart and then came back. You don't know where that person's going to come also from. Also be open to not being with your type. Yes. Quote unquote. I think there's like this thing where it's like, Oh, that's not my type. Maybe you don't know what your type is and maybe your type is evolved. I think people put looks so high mm -hmm. on the list. There's like, no way that if you had written down my stats and you gave it to Lauren Kind Zima, of a blonde guy. That she yeah. would have dated me. Oh, older, I thought you <laughs> No, older. Like, you know, I like I wouldn't have been. If you had said, okay, if we'd stopped back then and said, okay, Lauren, type of guy you're going to date. You probably wouldn't have said, uh, 50 year old father of two. Well, that's true. But I was always very open. I'm, I just am like a, a truly it's probably cause like my dad died when I was younger and at a very young age. I was, I realized you don't know what life's going to throw at you. So I just was always like, because we don't know what's coming, stay open to whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have a friend who it's the same thing. She will like, it's like, if he's not a Christian doctor who she met at church. Right. I'm like, this is not a Hallmark movie. Um, and you're closing yourself off from a lot of potential. You've, I think. you've narrowed it down to 0.001% yeah. of the is population. Your friend Sarah Palin? I, well, it's <laughs> a really good question. I'm She's, only dating people up in Alaska. I will tell you, she is a 37 year old virgin. So it, there, there's there a lot go. going on there, wow. but you probably didn't like, did you always want hair this slicked back, Lauren? I love his hairline. <laughs> I tell him it looks like a mix between Teresa Judice and Spock. <laughs> We're not Spock. What's the, what, what's the fucking that thing in the Star Wars with the, the hair? The, widow, the widow's peak? <laughs> the widow's peak. <laughs> no, the widow's peak is the thing that yeah. curves down. Oh, the Klingon look? Is that what you're No, I'm talking about what's oh, the not character? Star Trek. The character know. in Star Wars with the hair. The, Chewbacca? The one that has hair on space. <laughs> Chewbacca. No, but you know, um, I call me old fashioned. Mm -hmm. But this is why, and on this show I've talked about, I am not a fan of any of these dating apps. And I have, we both have young sisters and I get that this is, you know, people feel very pressured to date and meet people in this way. But what, to your points you're making, I think people are first delusional in many cases. And second, when you have applications that are all about the aesthetic first, right. And you can quickly, ooh, that eyebrows off or that. No, or I didn't like that hair. He's, you know, not tall enough for this. You, you're missing potentially so much about what you actually, when you get in a relationship, are really. Well, going if to you want. sit on a date, and I'm looking at Lauren, and I'm like, 
Yeah, I can I can already be scrolling. Wait, I'm already thinking a, about the next day. I have a question. Would you advise someone to where do you think people would have more success in love? On a dating app or going on a reality dating show? This podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand. Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place, all on your own terms. What the heck are you waiting for? If you've been listening to this show for years now or even just started, one of the major themes is to just launch. Get ready, go. Stop waiting for things to be perfect. Get it out there. This podcast started out of our living room. I think we spent maybe a couple hundred bucks on equipment. Since then, it's led to a product line. It's led to a full-fledged media company. It's led to so many things, live events. And it all started from this tiny gem of an idea of just starting something and putting it out online. This is why we love Squarespace so much. Like I mentioned at the beginning, Squarespace is an all-in-one one platform where you can host everything you want to do all online, all in one place, whether that's a newsletter, an email list, whether you want to build your own e-com site, if you want to sell courses, if you want to build a blog, Squarespace lets you do all of this. So stop waiting around, stop waiting for things to be perfect, get out there, launch it, adjust. And they have all sorts of blogging tools and analytics that you can use to go through all of your data and see if what you're doing is on the right path or if you need to adjust. Check it out and head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to www.squarespace.com slash skinny to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, that is squarespace.com slash skinny to save 10% off. Quick break to talk about Element. Do you find yourself in the middle of the day feeling sluggish, tired, a little out of it? Do you feel your workouts aren't as impactful as you would like them to be? Do you just feel a little bit out of it or that you catch that kind of afternoon slump out of nowhere? It's likely because you are not hydrating properly. We've all heard about drinking eight glass of water today. What's likely happening to most people is they do not have the proper electrolyte ratio in their water, which is why we love Element so much. Element comes in all these individualized packs that Lauren and I carry every day, and they have all of your electrolyte needs covered with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. It contains enough electrolytes to move the needle toward each of these electrolyte goals. You're also guaranteed to find an Element flavor you love. They have so many different ones. One of my favorite ones is mango chili, but they have a bunch of other ones, like I said. And the way that Lauren and I use this is every single morning when we go to the gym, we'll dump a packet of Element in there, go through our workout, and then if we feel a little sluggish or tired in the middle of the day or maybe during that afternoon stretch when we're trying to get the last bit of work done, we'll take a little bit then. What I've noticed since taking Element is I'm way more awake. I have way more clarity. I never feel dehydrated. I'm sleeping much better and I don't get nearly as many headaches as I used to. I'm someone who's suffered from headaches for years and ever since I started taking Element, they've pretty much gone completely away. Of course, Element just came up with a fantastic offer for us. Just go to drinkelement.com slash skinny to get a free sample pack with any purchase. Again, that is drinkelement.com slash skinny to get a free sample pack with any purchase. Enjoy. I, I'm not going to poo-poo on dating apps. I, I, I don't think, I would say definitely not a dating show only because the percentages are so low. Maybe There's, the intentions are off too. Well, one girl, one guy, you know, it's just, yeah, there's a lot numbers to deal game. with. But yeah, it's a numbers game. I am a firm believer that, look, dating apps work. I know, we know a lot of people who have met on dating apps. It's how quickly can you get off of that? Like when, when even when LZ DM'd me, I got it out of there as quick as I could. And I'm like, let's go out. Let's go have True. a coffee. Let's go have like a you're drink. What did you guys around. do? We went to Soho and Malibu. Hey, cute. And Fancy. It was, we figured it would seem normal because it was like, why is the lady from Entertainment Tonight with the host of The Bachelor? But if you're at Soho House, it's like, oh, eh, it's not, that's not yeah. weird. Yeah. The, you know, they're just probably met up or talking or business or whatever. So that was our first date. And uh, she didn't love it because I talked too much. And then I, I later said, you asked me too many questions, Barbara Walters. And because she went into interview mode, I started interviewing him and he started doing what he does and what he is doing right now, which he talks for a living. And he's supposed to give (laughs) answers and talk and do all those things. And yeah, I left the date. Interestingly, and I don't know what this says about me, but I didn't really like him, but I did go in for a kiss at the end of the night. And I think it's because I thought. Look well, but let's see the if fox. there's a total fox. You're like, I want on my resume that I Chris, that I Chris, I, that I kissed I, Chris Harrison. I kissed it. Hey, we, I Chris well, we were, so we were in the parking lot at Soho House and I really liked her. I was like really fascinated. I'd an been idiot. On, I had dated a lot, been on a lot of dates and I'm like, I, I didn't, 
It wasn't like, oh my God, I'm going to marry this girl. But I could tell this was different. I could tell she was different. I was feeling (laughs) different. And she, we got in the parking lot and I knew in the, in the business world, this would be difficult for her. Not for me. Why? Because she is a journalist and she's, I mean, there were some ethical questions about us. She's not covering the white house and sleeping with the president, but at the same time, (laughs) She is covering The Bachelor and she's supposed to have kind of a huh. journalistic integrity. And I said, look, this, you know, it's not the craziest thing in the world, but it won't. I think it was more. I said to him, the this perception. is well, and this is a bigger risk for me than it is for you. This is going to look like I'm trying to get ahead in my career. You're already very established. You're 17 years ahead of me in this career thing. Um, I'm like just starting. And I was afraid of how would it look like? How will it affect my career that I've aligned myself with him and with this brand that's already so established when like I'm still figuring out a lot of what well, I'm doing? Well, and the sexist double standard of who in Hollywood is going to give me a hard time for dating a hot young woman? Right. Who's going to give her a hard time for, you know, sleeping with the guy that she's interviewed? Did people give you a hard time? Um. Well, I mean, again, I think it was helpful that like I had to talk to my boss about it. Yeah. And we talked through it and I think they were ultimately um, okay with it. Again, I think it's helpful. It was entertainment news. Like I was covering this reality show. It wasn't like whether people's water is contaminated in the Midwest, you know, Um, no lives were at stake, but. It's not um, like a case in Georgia where you're prosecuting the president, former president of the United States. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I did, (laughs) relevant. (laughs) Um, I did have to like sometimes say to people and I, you know, I don't but like, like truly I would, I, we did have to do a separation of church and state. And I would tell him, I also, I enjoyed covering the show. I was like, I don't want to know the spoil. Like, don't tell me I want to cover it as I'm, as I'm covering it. And sometimes I would stop him mid conversation because he was about to slip on something. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to know that. Um, cause I wanted to maintain that boundary. But yeah. Then we were at Soho house parking lot. And I said, because of all this, I'm yeah. like, do you want to do this? And you know, I'm like, you need to think about this. If we want to have more dates and be seen. And that's when she laid one on me and she kissed me in the parking lot at Soho House. God, I don't remember the kiss being the answer to that question. That was really dumb of me in retrospect. That was a really bold, quick answer to that question. So did your your relationship like take a lot of momentum quickly or was it a slow build? No, it it took a lot of momentum quickly. Yeah, Yeah. we, I think we both knew who we were. We had both been divorced. Um, so when you find somebody you click with at that age, like I was like no 30, bullshit. Yeah. You just knew what you well, want. We quickly found out we had good chemistry from the kiss. Truly. The reason I kissed him was because I was like, I'm not totally sure about his personality, but like physically will we connect? Maybe we'll just hook up. I think I thought that to myself in my head really quick, but, um, then on the second date and I'm a big advocate of give people a second date, everything changed. I think we both relaxed a little bit. First dates are weird, right? Oof, like, yeah. it's so weird. It's like a job interview. It's a little tense, even though we knew each other a little and everything changed. And yeah, the momentum happened quickly. We also talked about everything for like the next 30 years of our life on our first date. We talked about moving to Texas, which we just did yeah. two years ago. But that's cool. on the first date, it was like, do you want kids? Do you want to? And I wouldn't recommend that if you're 22. <laughs> but if you're older, like why yeah. waste time? Talk like, about what's the your safety stuff. word? How did you guys both have <laughs> successful divorces? I don't know if we did. <laughs> I well, mean, you did. I, I mean, it, you did. Is that an think, oxymoron, a successful the, divorce? I think <laughs> in the scheme of divorces, we Yeah, did. no, I, we yeah. had very different situations, very different divorces. Obviously, I had kids in the mix. Um, mine, I would say, is very amicable to the point where, you know, Lauren and she have are friendly and will text. And that's cool. We always put the kids first. And really cool. I will give this for my ex. She's a good mom. She puts the kids first. And if you always have that as your goal, you swallow a lot of pride. You're not going to win everything. You know, don't, if you can take yourself out of it, which look, we, we still have our issues and our problems. There's a reason we got divorced, but all of us have committed and she's remarried too. And her husband does the same. And I give him kudos. The kids are first. Yeah. And so, you know, that we, we're going to see her this weekend because our my our son plays lacrosse up at TCU, so we'll go see him play. And it's mom's weekend, so we'll see her, and it's fine. Did you guys talk about like, I mean, where you two are now? We're in very similar positions. You work together a lot. You live together. You guys have two kids together. How early on were you talking about like what you wanted your life to look like? Was it sixth grade? 
Yeah. yeah. I actually asked I mean, him to marry I, me I, in sixth grade. I, I'm very hesitant to talk. I, I know that our story is not so common in the sense that like we've known yeah. each we've known each other now longer than more than half of our uh, our, our entire time we've been alive, right? Like 12 and now we're 36. Um, but yeah, I think we've always, I think what makes Lauren and I work together is we're very open and aligned in, in what we both have ambition in life for. Mm. Even like not on the, even on the business stuff, but how we want to have kids and where we want to move. And we always talked about like, okay, we're going to have a life where we bounce around. Like maybe it's LA, maybe it's Texas, maybe it's somewhere else. We, I think a lot of the stuff is easy. The other stuff is easy to figure out over time. If you're just aligned on like life's ambitions and what you actually want, yeah. you know, as parents or as entrepreneurs or as a couple. Um, and I, we spend a lot of time making sure that we're talking about that a lot. I have a friend who like is in an issue with her husband right now because they don't know where they want to live. I have friends who are, she's in a tough spot right now because she and her husband are married, have a kid, but they don't know where they want to live. And they're in disagreement about that. And I'm like, did you guys talk about it before? She's like, I think we talked about like what our lives might look like, but didn't get as specific as where we wanted to live. But what's interesting for you guys is you change. Like, obviously, I'm not even talking sixth grade. Obviously, you changed (laughs) from that. But even when y'all got back together post-college. Yeah. Yeah, different. Y'all are different than you are when in your mid to late 30s. I mean, you've grown up and it's hard. Luckily, you guys have been able to somehow form this amazing relationship around creating businesses and you've gone on the same path as opposed to uh, Lauren's going this way and Michael's going to go this way. I mean, y'all are very fortunate in that way as you've been able to grow together. We have both probably changed even <laughs> since we left California individually. I mean, before Lauren got here, I mean, I don't think she had a stake in her entire life. I mean, now she's a big meat eater out here. Mm. But anyways, small things. My bowl of meat. We've always been aligned on values and supported each other in the changes on those yeah. values. And, you know, even like, I'll give you an example we work together and we tell couples all the time, maybe you start a venture together and your idea is like, Hey, I want to have this small thing with five or six people. And like, that's all I want. And mom and pop. And the other person's like, well, I want to go build the the spaceship. You may think you want to work together, but if you're not aligned on where you want Mm -hmm. that vision to go, that's also a problem. Right. And so we, we, we get like really detailed. And whenever we talk about big decisions, like, okay, does Texas make sense? Why? What would it look like? Would you be happy there? Would I be happy? Vice versa. You know, I, I have a transition that I have to yes. ask you that I have not heard you answer. Was there relief in leaving The Bachelor? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it kind of like oh, you you did it for 19 yeah. years? Not only There's just... There's got to be like, ugh. Like you, you almost like take your your pants off it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you take just, your like, bra off. Yeah, yeah. You take your bra off. You like yeah. your tits hang yeah. out. You're like, I yeah. did it. I can check it. I did it the best I could. There's got to be a relief. I was ready to pop my puss. <laughs> um, is that the correct term? Yeah. I don't think that's yeah. using it yes. correctly. I think you're doing it right. Um, <gasps> no, it, de- there definitely was a relief in that when you've done it for so long. And also I've always loved being innovative and creating and trying new things and pushing myself and and it had become repetitive and formulaic and yeah it's hard to reinvent something like my favorite times surrounding the bachelor were in the early days when you didn't know what a rose ceremony was there was no such thing we were creating it we were creating the terminology and the words and the, you you'd go in and say something and you're like oh my god that was really stupid take that out let's try it this way and so those were the fun days of you're, you're building something. And we had long since moved away from that. It was fun when we started Paradise because it got to create something again or Winter Games or when you got to do new endeavors. Um, I, live the, I love the live shows because, again, those were always new and invigorating. So the show for me over that many years, I always called it Dazed and Confused where, you know, I kept getting older. They stayed the same age because it was the same, you know, same group of 20 somethings came in and we're doing it over and over. So yeah, mentally, emotionally, and I think professionally, a bit of a relief to kind of like change. Take the bra off. Force. Yeah. Take the bra off. And also the world hang my tits out. The wor- hang your tits out. The world evolved too. And it, it sometimes feels like a lot of these shows, and this is my opinion, yeah. placate to what, society is feeling the one day society is right one day it's left one day it's here one day it's there and it feels like sometimes the that these big corporations are like placating to like whatever the narrative is at the moment and that's exhausting well and also that's why i have it, my own podcast well and when a show is created in 2001 2002 it's gonna be different <laughs> how much has the world changed right i mean again there was this 
innocence and naivete of reality TV. There, I mean, there was no such thing as a blog back then, much less Facebook. Then you get to Twitter. Then you get to, to influencers. So the world has changed so much. But when your concept and the formula hasn't changed, it's hard to keep up. Like, for example, the rose ceremony used to be such a big deal. We would spend so much money on the cocktail party and the rose ceremony. And you realize now, 20 years later, that's not moving the needle. And you're, you're, tie, and you're tied to these things that are instruments of the show. So it's very mm -hmm. difficult to evolve when you know, you're known for something. It's like, say you're McDonald's. That's what we were. We're the McDonald's of reality TV and you're known for this. And it's like, but we can't do this anymore. We got to kind of ebb and flow and change with the times. Well, and you're dealing and with, it's hard. like to your point, I mean, I'm speaking for you, but these are just things I've heard you say. It's, you were, I know they were, you were, some producers were really trying to innovate, but you're dealing with really big corporations mm -hmm. who are really thinking about money as their bottom line. And it's really hard to innovate and change. Um, and he and I both have to like, there's also something in this business when you're in a situation like that, like you're putting you like, this isn't an actor playing a role. It's like, you're Chris Harrison on this thing, or I'm Lauren Zima on entertainment tonight. And you're putting you out there, all the risk of you, like being yourself yet you are beholden to what all these voices behind you are telling you yeah. to say, Dynamic. making you say you're under a contract. Your social media is under a contract. So yeah, like owning and doing your well, own I podcast is I imagine with what you guys route. are doing now with your show <laughs> and honestly doing this, like I don't think creators realize, and I just say creators broadly, could be mm -hmm. influencers, whatever you want to call it, like realize how fortunate they are to be able to produce stuff without how, like there's, there, you guys walked in, there is no approval. There's nobody else behind. Right. There's nobody's telling me what we can and can't do. There's nobody it saying. It eliminates the politics. Of yeah. It. Like whatever's going on politically or socially, like I don't care. Like I just do my thing and some like it, some don't. But like that, the internet has basically democratized and made it possible for us to yeah. do whatever we you want. Realize you're, you realize you, Lauren brings up a good point that you, at first you feel like, oh, they love me. They love me. And they're pushing you forward. And you, and you realize you, I was the face and the voice of the bachelor for 20 years. I did all the interviews because everybody changes, right? The bachelor leaves, there's new contestants or no, whatever. You you're the, the constant. Bachelor. You're the constant. When I hear you talk, it's like, that's this. So you are, you're so the brand. <laughs> what happened early on is say there's, uh, and it could have been something benign, but something controversial happens. Send out Chris Harrison. Well, as things grew, more controversy. Some stuff was very controversial on and off camera. Send out Chris Harrison, send out Chris Harrison. What you realize later, because you don't think about it at the time, is you're being used for your face and your voice and your likeness. And, you know, I was told many times, hey, go, go put that smile on and let's put that Chris Harrison out there. You know, go do your, go do the dance, you know, make things right, go save it. And you realize your name is on the line here. And it's, you know, they're not, they're, they're back at the office their name's never going to be in print. And so, and if things go well, thanks, buddy, you did a great job. If things don't go well, you're on your own, you're on your own. And you realize you look behind you and you're like, oh crap, nobody's standing behind me anymore. Before you go, how are you both creating your own future on your own terms without someone <laughs> doing what they do? I, I think we're both really excited and happy about work right now in a way we hadn't been in a while. And like, again, I'm so, we're, we're both so thankful for every we had very cool jobs. Like we, we had very cool, very glamorous jobs at the end of the day. Um, but now, like we feel really reinvigorated, liberated. Um, probably. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I feel like I had one of the greatest runs ever. And like, I'm, honestly, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, I got away with murder. I mean, I, I feel <laughs> like I won the lottery a thousand times over. I've loved everything from sports casting to game shows to, you know, Miss America to the Bachelor Bachelorette franchise. It's been a dream. So now the cool thing is being where I am with this amazing woman I love, it's more important to me who I work with and, and where we're going as opposed to that old fire and that, the, again, the desperation of, I just need to work. I need a job. I need a hosting gig. Because you know back in the day, you're like, I, I just want to work. And what's next? What's next? Now I get to sit back and relax, let my, my boobs hang out, as you guys would say. <laughs> uh, but now I get to choose and, and we can say no, but it's more important of like, what's that next step with us? And we do have some very exciting stuff coming up. Our next step is going to be amazing. And we get to do I it I wish together. we could announce it now. Okay. You don't have to announce yes. it now, but tell us where we can listen to the podcast, find your social media. So when you do announce it, 
We know. Onlyfans.com. Uh, no. Uh, or backslash yeah. Bachelor Voice. Uh, we're obviously Instagram, Crispy Harrison and, and Lauren Zima. She was. He is. I, let's talk. He made. I don't know how you didn't get at Chris Harrison originally, but he the, is at Chris B. Harrison. I'll tell you the story. Greg Grunberg, uh, actor. He was on uh, really good friends with J.J. Abrams. He's been on all, all these alias and lost and all these movies in the show Heroes and all that. We were friends because he was on a show called Alias on ABC. And he told me about this thing called Twitter. And it was brand new. And he's like, dude, you got to get on Twitter. And I was like, what? what are you oh, you're really about? aging yourself yeah. right now. So I was one of the first people on. But Chris, shockingly enough, there's other Chris Harrisons in the world. Uh, and so I was like, I didn't know what a handle was or why it was important. So I just, my middle initial, B, Chris B. Harrison. Not thinking it sounds like crispy. Harrison, yes. like that's what I thought you said in the beginning. I thought, oh, yeah. crispy Harrison. That's, that's why that. I paused to clarify. The producers on The Bachelor started calling me Crispy. Say Crispy. <laughs> at least you didn't do at Bachelor Chris, like yeah. at Bravo Andy, or we so did a really know. different situation. So I just situation. Was, yeah, that would have sucked considering yeah. I left. So I'm at Lauren Zima. He's at Chris B. Harrison. But and, we host the most dramatic yes. podcast ever, and uh, on uh, where all podcasts are found, wherever that is in the ether. Um, but we've been doing that together, and it's been fun. But there are much bigger uh, things ahead for us. Can I ask you a quick question before we go? I know we're running out of time, but you said that you thought you could win The Bachelor. Yeah, did I can. You, did I you can. ever think I about- I still do, Chris. Sorry, yeah. I do. No, you could. I think, by the way, I think you could do. Yeah. I would have did some. you ever think about being in the hot seat and like him grilling you? And like, what should he ask you to grill you? We should have started with this. With what Chris would ask yes. me? Well, I would become friends with Chris. I would uh, manipulate a friendship in some way. I, I know you would be kept away from me, but I would charm Chris. No, people found a way. Like I, I, yeah, I, I, I formed friendships. I fully think and by the way, would. I formed friendships with people and I 100% looked after them. 100%. At this point, yeah. I honestly don't doubt the things she, so I just, if she says she's going to win, I but just said, I agree. How long do you think it would, Take me to make you cry. No, I know. That's the thing. That's why I think I would win. I would take all emotion out you of You don't it. win without crying. You have I'll, to Okay, cry. I'll do a fake cry if the producers <laughs> want me to. I'll do a fake cry. I would do a fake cry, no problem. I could fake cry. I think Put a little under, onion in my eye. I think in under 10 minutes, I could get to you. I don't think so, Chris. Yeah. We should. You should come back and we should just time her on 10 minutes and see. Really? I need yeah. a more intimate relationship Perfect. in the in the interview like <laughs> let's put some rose petals around yeah. i know how to make her cry no, i don't mean sexual i just mean like we, you know, no, we gotta be closer you want to make her cry wait till she's like in a little bit of a deep sleep and wake her up and start being that loud and chaotic yeah. and she will cry Take off her mouth patch. when yeah. he turns the lights on in the morning without asking me no <laughs> fucking way uh <laughs> thank you guys Chris for having and Lauren, us thank you for coming on you guys go follow them uh the, and go listen to their podcast because they truly have the two best voices chris's voice for me is just nostalgic and calming and reminds me of my childhood. And I mean, to me, you are the bachelor. And then Lauren's voice is kind of like sexy and raspy. You guys Thank got you. great voice for podcasts. I'm like when Phoebe is sick on that episode of Friends. Perfect. I love yeah. a little cold. It gives you like a little. <laughs> and you have to listen now because you guys will be on the most dramatic yes. podcast ever. So yes. yeah, we're, we were, we're on the show. Up. Everybody go listen. Go listen. Lauren, Crispy, us. thank you for coming Chris on. Good to have new friends you. in Austin, Texas. Yes, yes, for sure. Austin, Texas. 